I have shared my screen. Okay, I think the number of participants is uh, is increasing. So we're gonna welcome everyone. Uh, we are gonna allow still one minute uh, for other participants to arrive. Thanks for being here. Uh, in one minute, uh, I will start the presentation of our uh, guest speaker and, uh, and we will start the, the webinar. All right. Um, so welcome everyone to webinar ser series of the Barcelona Dash Forecast Center, uh, the Barcelona Dash Regional Center, sorry, WMO. Um, so today we have uh, with us um, Basilis Amiridis, Dr. Basilis Amiridis, who is a research director at the National Observatory of Athens in Greece. Uh, Vasilis is a, is an, is a aerosol LiDAR expert. Um, he works very closely with Actris and ESA in uh, satellite CalVal and data ex exploitation. And uh, he has an ERC, a very interesting ERC on the study of the impact of particle electrification on dust transfer processes. And uh, he's a member of many committees, including the the SDS was the EOLO Science Advisory Group, the European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures, and uh, the Earning Net Council. So we're very pleased of having Basilis, and today Basilis is going to talk about the ASCOX experiment in Cape Verde. So thanks a lot, Basilis. You have the floor. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Let me share my screen. So just let me let me just say, Vasilis, that uh, for for the questions, uh, you can you can write down your questions in the Q and A. Try not to do it in the chat. There's a Q and A option in your Zoom. So so just uh, type there your questions, and by the end of the webinar, we will try to to uh, tell Vasilis all those questions so uh, he can respond. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. I will give. I will try to give a presentation on the recent uh, experimental campaign that we implemented in the Cabo Verde archipelago. They call as cost, and it's related to desert dust research. And specifically, I will try to demonstrate how we aim to use these data sets in order to to enhance and validate satellite products to to optimize data simulation and do the advanced knowledge on atmospheric dust processes and improve dust modeling. So for that presentation, I will give also examples from past studies that we have implemented at NOAA with good collaborators from Tropos, BSC, ECMWF, PMOD, INOE, and the Cypress Institute. Uh, most of these studies have been uh, uh, funded by the European Space Agency as well as ASCOS and uh, have been supported by the ACTRIS European Research Infrastructure and My ERC Project Detect. 
So as COS is an experiment that has been implemented in Cabo Verde in the island of Sao Vicente in Mindelo. And we have covered three months, September 2021 and June and September 2022. ASCOS was a part of the ground-based component of the larger uh, cluster of campaigns called ZTAC, uh, fully funded by ESA and actually targeting the EOLUS satellite calibration and validation activities, but also as a pre-launch activity for Earthcare's uh, future mission of ESA. So in June of 2020, in September of 2021, we had co-located measurements along with the Avatar and Cadiva campaigns from DLR and Latmos. We have flown two uh, aircrafts, Falcon aircrafts, uh, deploying uh, Doppler wind lidars, radars, lidars in, uh, on board the aircrafts and also in situ measurements. While in the experiments of 2022, we had a combined measurements from light aircrafts and uh, drones from the Slovenian light aircraft and Cyprus Institute drones, along with NASA that has joined us in September 2022 with the uh, DC-8 aircraft uh, and implemented a campaign called CPEX, targeting mainly aerosol cloud interaction and uh, impact of aerosol on tropical convection. So as close was the ground-based component and for that, we have deployed at Mindelo the Actris uh, aerosol and cloud remote sensing facilities, uh, basically a poly-XT LiDAR and a wind halo LiDAR, a microwave radiometer, an iron subatometer, a disdrometer, and a cloud radar. While we have also uh, measurements from the drones of the Cyprus Institute, uh, which is an Actris uh, exploratory platform, we deployed several small UAV UAVs with sensors for in situ measurements in factors, the UCAS probe, and also the cobalt uh, sensor for particle backscatter measurements. On top of this instrumentation, we deployed the EVE LiDAR, a system, a LiDAR system that has been developed by NOAA and Raymetrics, specifically for ILUS CalVal, by, funded by ESA. And also the Wally polarization LiDAR, a new system emitting linearly and elliptically polarized light at 1064 nanometers, designed specifically to measure particle preferential orientation. And finally, we have deployed some sensors on board radio sonde measurements, uh, aiming to measure atmospheric electricity, electric charge, and electric field. You see some first measurements here. Let me grab the laser pointer. Here are the measurements, the profiling measurements with the electrometer developed by Lee. And here are some examples of uh, the measurements that we have collected from Kinews LiDAR measurements. This is a time height plot you see here from zero up to seven kilometer. The attenuated backscatter coefficient showing a lot of activity in the free troposphere, a fully developed marine boundary layer here. And this is the particle depolarization ratio, which is actually uh, maximizing where we have non spherical particles in the atmosphere. And you see here, so it's ident it identifies the presence of desert dust in these free tropospheric layers. When one uses a synergy between LiDAR and sun photometer measurements, we can apply synergistic uh, algorithms for inversions. This is uh, developed, has been developed by Oleg Dubovic. It's a garlic code similar to GRASP actually, but applied for ground-based measurements. What we can get from this uh, synergies in uh, Actris is Actually, we get the three uh, backscatter, three wavelengths, multi-wavelength backscatter measurements. We have extinction and two channels and intensive properties such as the angstrom exponent, which identifies basically the size of the particles and the depolarization ratio showing the location of the dust layer here in the free troposphere in this case. When we combine with IronNet, we can get size distributions and also single scattering albedo profiles, but also concentration profiles, both in the fine and coarse mode. This is another example from the CloudNet measurements. The cloud remote sensing facilities comes from the synergy of the microwave radiometer, the cloud radar that we deployed in Mindelo, 
You see here some interesting uh, feature classifications. This is ice, uh, rain, and multi uh, and clouds, uh, mixed phase clouds in this case. While these are the measurements that we have gathered with the Cypress Institute drones, you see here some interesting uh, in situ measurements within the sun, denoted here with the lighter measurements from. Uh, 1.5 to 4 kilometers. So this is the concentration measured by the drones. And these are some size distribution retrievals, preliminary results here showing the presence of particles up to 60 micron within the dust layers probe. So how we will use these measurements for what is the exploitation plan for these measurements that we gathered in Astros? I will give three uh, different chapters here in my presentation, three group of, uh, uh, of uh, applications. The first one is related to the validation and enhancement of satellite products. So in terms of CalVal activities, you see here, a first study by Tropos by Holger, recently published in AMT, showing the validation of the wind profiles from Eolus. With red, we have here the wind profile from Eolus up to 20 kilometers while with green, uh, sorry, radiation is with red, with green and the blue are the two different uh, retrievals from the high spec resolution uh, uh, Dr. Leiter. Uh, we have the relay and the mini retrievals. So we saw a very good comparison uh, based on the ASCOS measurement here for Elvis. Furthermore, uh, Peristera has published recently also the Calval study for the Arzo product of EUS. We see here the measurements with Eve in Cabo Verde and how well they compare to the backscatter, to the extinction retrieval from EUS, but also the LIDAR ratio and the volume depolarization ratios. The LIDAR ratio is a very critical parameter also for other sensors such as the backscatter, Calypso, the Cali polarization backscatter LIDAR. In space, a system that provided us with 15 years of useful measurements for hours or research. This is a, very, a, a retrieval, however, that relies a lot on the LIDAR ratio assumption. And Calypso team did a lot of work to tackle this, uh, this uh, uncertainty in the extinction retrieval. For that, we see here for desert dust specifically that we have a lot of variability regional independent LIDAR ratios that have to be tackled somehow in the Calypso retrieval. We have values from 35 up to 50 steradians for different deserts within the dust belt, as we see here from the Actris PolyXT LIDAR network retrievals. And this is the variability around the mean value that Calypso very correctly uh, assumes for dust. And this is a proposition for depolarization dependent LIDAR ratios for different deserts of the world, as have been summarized in the recent publication of Athena from Chopos in an atmospheric measurement technique, techniques uh, journal. And here is an interesting result from, uh, from uh, Mustaka et al. will be presented in this year's NGU, where we see that there is also a distribution of the depolarization ratio around the deserts, above the deserts. So we have higher values of particle depolarization in the Western Sahara and Asian deserts, and lower values over the Middle East and Sub-Saharan regions. We assume, and we believe that maybe this is connected to the mineralogy, and uh, we really expect, we are anticipating the new mineralogical maps from EMIT and models that will have a source receptor uh, simulation in order to, to connect our measurements with different regions and mineralogies to explain the variability in our intensive property measurements. And concluding on that, on some typical properties around desert dust, optical properties, at least in our case for remote sensing, we are able then to apply uh, algorithms such as the polyphon has been introduced by Alberto Dante and Matthias and has been applied by Noah in uh, for Calypso, where we are using the particle depolarization information to separate the non spherical particles from the spherical particle contribution within the same volume. 
So doing that, we are getting extinction profiles for desert dust and for other aerosol types, something that is actually, we cannot see that only because we have the polarization channel available in the ground-based measurements shown here, but also in Calypso. So what we do in Calypso is to use this information to separate the pure dust from any other non-depolarizing aerosols within the same volume. We have compared these retrievals with filter measurements showing a nice comparison, qualitative comparison in this case, while doing that in the backscatter, we can then apply a regional dependent LIDAR ratio from the ground-based measurements. And then we get extinction and respective dust optical depth values that are closer to IronNet as demonstrated in my paper in 2013. And here is the result, what we can get from Calypso. This is the total AOD, and this is the dust AOD. You see how nicely the anthropogenic contribution and biomass contribution has been removed, and how aerosol optical depths are located over the dust belt and the outflow regions here. This product is very powerful and can be used also to, to retrieve fine information for example, here using and Lenny demonstrated how you can use latitudinal cross sections for standing desert dust transport. You see here some fine details for this transport in this zone, for example, showing uh, also some orographic effects in dust transport by Alps or Carpathian Mountains in case in the case of Romania. And this is another 2D uh, map retrieval you can get from this uh, analysis for desert dust and how. They are relate, relating to the dust top height of the dust layer. Very critical uh, for aerosol cloud interaction studies, as also shown here in this preliminary work of uh, Eleni, where she integrated values between different height ranges and calculated the ice nucleate concentration from Calypso related to desert dust, of course. And these are preliminary results on these concentrations. The product has been developed based on the polyform suggested by uh, Rovanti in 2017. And then Eleni applied this algorithm for ground based LiDAR measurements and validated against uh, UAV measurements, drone measurements that we for INP, similarly for, for what we measured uh, in uh, ASCOS. And this is the last product that I want to show to you related to the dust deposition. This has been recently developed by Manolis in a project led by Angela and is a study called DOMOS, where we are trying to calculate to, to have first retrievals from dust deposition from satellite measurements. To do that, we use LIVAS uh, profiles uh, multiplied by the RFI winds in order to calculate fluxes. And between the, the several cones, we are trying to find the mass loss in between. So this mass loss is related to the deposition. And these are first maps that have been produced by Manolis. This is the Levas product. This is the Levas in uh, conjunction with Midas. This is a dust product from Modis. And this is Levas profiles along with the LDs retrieved by IASI ULB algorithm. These are, again, preliminary results that are under validation with buoys uh, that we have uh, deployed also for ASCOS and that deliver the position measurements in the Atlantic. And these synergies between active and passive remote sensing actually gave us a lot of uh, new information and insights. And this is actually uh, what we did also for Midas. Adonis has been presented his work, GICAS, in AMT 2021 and 2022, you can find this nice data set that actually relies on the Calypso uh, calculation of the dust contribution of the total load and uh, on MODIS LD to deliver uh, dust optical depths with spatial resolution of 0.1 degrees, global data sets, daily values for 15 years that can be used as shown in Lovotet set out recently for trend analysis to study variations in desert dust loads, but also in data simulation, which brings me to the second 
section of my presentation. So if you are still here, let's proceed with the data, continue with the data simulation and related operators and how the ASCOS measurements uh, will provide new insights on that. This is an example on how LIBAS uh, has been used uh, by BSC, Geronimo, did a lot of work on Monarch in order to assimilate LIBAS profiles. And this uh, plot shows how well uh, the final model simulations uh, have been uh, optimized in the, to be closer to ground-based LiDAR measurements. This is a very nice study demonstrating uh, how we should actually evaluate the impact on the assimilation from the assimilation of LiDAR profiles, we cannot uh, do that by comparisons against iron at the columnar values. We need to find ground-based LiDAR profiles in order to see if we improve the vertical distribution within the model, right? And again, we see here this problem with uh, the work of Sarah, where she tried a lot to find a measure to validate and evaluate the model ranks here by either filtering, we usually do, we are filter with the angstrom exponent, the iron measurements, or we integrate for the coarse mode, but actually that has also a fine mode, and this is a problem. And this is an example how LIVAS integrated LIVAS within the column values can help for model evaluation and also the assimilation impact. Uh, when you use LIVAS, here is the dream model, showing very nice, uh, comparison with the observations of LIBAS. And here is very impressive how well we get better correlation between model and observations, especially when we have, uh, when we go uh, as, as the height decreases, because we have more uh, impact from uh, the anthropogenic carbons here, the emission near the surface. So we, the correction is better as the height uh, decreases here. On another note, I want to also show here some uh, work that we did within the Newton is a study with Adonis Gikas. We used this new, uh, this new data set, the wind profiles from EOS. These data sets have been proved to improve a lot in WP. They had a large impact in this uh, in NWP. This is a flagship Earth care. Uh, Earth Explorer mission. And uh, we try to see how these uh, updated meteorological fields can improve also desert dust transport. You see here in the assimilation fields, a deepening of the low pressure system centered eastwards of Cape Verde and similar improvements also over the desert. And this is very critical because over deserts and over the ocean, we do not have enough measurements to constrain models. And you see here how those wind fields have improved. Improved. We don't know if, uh, if they improved, but we see large deviations on the dust emission rates over the Sahara. And the departures from this rate become more evident in lead times close to EOS overpass denoted here with the red line. And this is the impact in uh, between the assimilated winds and non-assimilated wind runs uh, for the dust optical depth. We see DOD differences up to 0.4 in absolute terms in downwind areas. We also tested in the ad cross unit study with Angela the impact of aerosol assimilation on uh, NWP. And we see actually a lot uh, of, uh, we see better performance of the model uh, for the experiment with interactive aerosols, assimilated aerosols in these blue shaded areas. And this is very in temperature, but also for the wind field. And this is something that we should uh, take into consideration in the future uh, for EOLUS. This is very useful. And HUMATSAT is uh, interested in that because uh, actually the European space agencies are planning for three future missions uh, like EOLUS. And we are now studying the impact of both wind and aerosol assimilation. And this will be done in the future study called L2A Plus, where we will implement this uh, capability. Now, in terms of uh, operators for data simulation, one thing that we should focus on is how well we represent the optical and radiative properties 
of uh, dust particles within the models and how well we convert between concentrations and extinction optical properties that are retrieved from space and the, what the operators do exactly in, in that assimilation. And for that, we all know the spheroid model that has been used in the past, from the, the last 20 years actually, from OLEC, a, a robust model for represented, uh, representing uh, dust properties. And there have been suggestions lately from Huang, but also for ellipsoids, but also from Saito and Yang, recent uh, proposition for the TAMU dust di database that is actually modeled based on the irregular hexahedral particles. Now, although all these scattering databases reproduce well the optical properties of dust, uh, it seems that they do not manage to reproduce uh, the backscatter properties that it's actually related to the LiDAR ratio, the depolarization, and the backscatter coefficient itself which are basically the products that will be delivered by EarthCare, Eolus, but also Calypso and the future atmosphere observing system of NASA. Some promising results have been uh, reported by Gus Tiger. He used this model of particles, which is actually based on more realistic shapes, more closer to what we see in the electron microscopy. But these scattering calculations are actually constrained up to 10 micron, and we need to uh, provide more uh, scattering calculations and lookup tables for larger particles here for 1064. This plot is for 1064 nanometers. This work is in progress at uh, NOAA with Alexandra. She's trying to apply ADA for larger particles and physical optics approximation for even larger particles. And we need these calculations in the super course mode because recently we all know uh, the recent results presented by Bernadette and Claire Ryder with their airborne measurements of size distribution showing that super course dust particles sustain for longer distances that we expect from the models in the atmosphere. Recently, Claire showed also the impact of the large particles in. Uh, optical properties such as extinction and absorption, which is not negligible at all. And now Alexandra, along with Steios, are trying to calculate the impact on TOA, on top of atmospheric <coughs> radiation. And for that, we're using typical size distributions over the source and over the outflow regions as provided by Claire. And typical dust refractive indices found in the literature. And we are trying to have a closure with measurements at ground, short wave direct solar irradiance in Cabo Verde from as close as here. The other estimation we find due to the super coarse mold in TOA radiation exhibits a warming effect above deserts, while the impact is only minor, minor due to the transport above ocean. And the final chapter I want to discuss and present to you some preliminary results is related to the atmospheric dust processes, where we find here that actually the super coarse mode will know that is not transported. Models cannot sustain the particles over the Atlantic. So we cannot reproduce measurements, actually. What we did here, Aleni Drakaki did a lot of work to actually include these uh, super coarse particles in the models. This is the, the radius, the diameter that the cutoff diameter for the models that we have usually have. And let me try to expand up to 60 micron. So these are the simulations for the new beams. And we see that for particles above 10, we do not see a lot of transport in the Atlantic. In order to achieve the size distributions with the model, that we measured, actually Claire Ryder measured above the Cabo Verde. And then he had to re reduce the settling velocity of the particles by 60 to 80%. So there should be something there that keeps the particle lift lofted. And there have been a lot of process that have been suggested for that. I, I try to overview here some of them. It's the dynamics related to numerical diffusion and turbulence. 
the dust aspherity and shape, the electrostatic forces and particle orientation, but also the water vapor impact on convection. Now, particle asphericity, and we remember here the study, the very significant study of Paul Zinou, uh, who suggested, who proved that actually does not play a lot of uh, role in the transport. This is true, even for non-realistic uh, aspect ratios. However, Eleni, in a recent work that she is implementing now, found that the asphericity is three times more efficient in sustaining the mass, the dust mass, other and more detailed diffusion schemes. Uno 3 in this case, propagates the particles 500 kilometers further away from their sources. And this is something that we examine at the moment. Here is something that we also have uh, put a lot of work within my ERC project. We try to see if the electric salt can explain uh, the long range transport of the super coarse particles. Actually, what we assume here is because the uh, large particles are positively charged and the, the fine mode is negatively charged. Due to the gravitational settling, we may have a separation of the, of the charge. And this may develop an electric field, an electric uh, force uh, that could uh, counteract gravity. But, uh, and also could induce a particle orientation if the particle is charged within this field may be oriented vertically. So a preferential vertical orientation for the particles at 90 degrees, at zero degrees. However, Sotiris Mayos calculated based on our measurements for electricity in Cabo Verde and Ascos, that since the electric field is not larger than 500 volts per meter in all the measurements that we got in uh, ASCOS. This field can create, can induce a particle, a preferential particle orientation. It cannot do nothing in gravity. It's, uh, there's no impact on that, but it can induce some particle orientation, vertical orientation. However, the dynamic torque of the particles uh, are much stronger. And actually, the, the total torque uh, creates a particle orientation of zero degrees. So we have horizontally oriented particles for dust, especially uh, for larger, the super cosmo. So if we could find a methodology to measure particle orientation, then maybe this is also a measurement that will point, point us to the super coarse mode. So, the observational evidence for particle orientation. We have uh, some uh, we have some reports from Ulanovsky from 2007 from star photometry, where user, Joseph said that uh, we see some excess uh, in uh, polarization measured by a polarimeter, star polarimeter. And we try to do the same here with, uh, in collaboration with Joseph, uh, with Lilida Skalopoulou, and she found that uh, with solar polarimetry that we get the same uh, degree of linear polarization in the measurements, uh, which is actually can happen only when you have particle orientation. So there is a first indication of particle orientation from these measurements. And then we developed this slider, the WALI. Alexandra developed this system that emits both linear and elliptically polarized light. It is capable to, to calculate a flag for orientation, which is actually based in the off diagonal elements of the Miller matrix in order, which are, are non-zero only when we have particle orientation. And we tested that in a case that we know that we have particle orientation, which is the case of rain. Here we have some rain doublets, which are horizontally oriented. And here is the orientation flag that we get from Wally. So the system works. And these are the first measurements that we got from SAL in ASCOS, where we observe particle orientation within the SAL. But we have some strange results. For the same layer, we observe, then we not observe, then we observe again. And now we are trying to see what is really happening here. And if we assume that this is a measure also for the super cross mode presence, we have to see what really happens here. We are examining these datasets 
uh, in synergy with the halo wind, Doppler wind, LiDAR measurements we have here. You see for the orientation case, we have some strong updrafts here, downdrafts in the non-orientation and updrafts again. This could be a first explanation maybe because updrafts like that are not simulated by models it's of the order of one meter per second. In this case, we have 0.2 meter per second for the dust transfer model updraft. And such updrafts are capable of sustaining the oriented particles in the super coarse uh, region. So in the models, we see that we cannot uh, reproduce these updrafts and the super coarse uh, particle settling velocities are well above the simulation. However, Eleni provided some new runs with higher resolution showing that she can retrieve updrafts of that level in higher resolution of one by one kilometer runs. However, this is again a local phenomenon around Cabo Verde, most probably due to the topographic effects and maybe gravity waves that we see here. So in order to explain the long range transport, we need something more over the Atlantic. And for that, we are also testing the assumption for the water vapor within the south. We see here from the radio zones that we observe orientation only when the sun is drier with lower relative humidities at the bottom. And when we have stronger inversions, you see here. So this is something that may affect convection. So this is all under a study. These are only results, the indications that I'm trying to show here to see how interest, interesting are all these mass measurements that we gathered in ESCOS. And the take home message is that we haven't solved yet the cross mode paradox, but we will continue working on it. That the ASCOS data sets provide an upper, upper database for desert dust research. Similar experiments would be very important and will happen in the future also in support of the flux emissions, earth care, and atmosphere observing system. And any studies that uh, coming from you, from the dust community, over these data sets are more than welcome. The data sets are open and we will support their use in any case. And for that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I am tired already, Carlos. <laughs> thank you very much, Vasily. That was, uh, that was, uh, that's a lot of work, um, a lot of different issues in one presentation. Congratulations for, for the amount of work, the, uh, the observations that you're gathering for the community. This is kind of very impressive. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so I would be expecting uh, questions by the audience. So uh, could you perhaps, um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Could you ask your questions, please? Uh, if not, the, the chairs of the session will, will ask their questions. Okay, I'm gonna start. Um, so, um, Maybe somebody else, Sara Zlobodan, can you confirm there are no questions? No, I cannot see questions. Yes. No, but also if someone wants to speak and you, raise the hand. Can you raise your hand if you want to, to ask a question, please? Okay, so um, so please uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question or use a Q and A. Okay, so uh, Basilis, what is your um, where is your your perspective now? If, you know, you you have all uh, this bunch of processes. So can you tell us already? You are discarding already, uh, in your opinion, uh, the, these electric effects. Um, so this can be discarded, in your opinion. There's more research that should go in that direction what is your what is your opinion on that um, we spent five years of research to develop these sensors for electric charge and electric field we try to do our best in order to measure the electric fields within the cell uh, in high LDs, in high dust optical depths and we see that uh, 
this the electric field is not capable of uh, applying any uh, force that could counteract gravity. It's not it's negligible. So this is the conclusion uh, of our study. Actually, this is not something that I can put my my head on, you know, for sure. But this is to me what I get from these uh, five years of research over the electricity. So as a process, I don't believe that it plays a role on that. It might uh, in the case of particle orientation, but again, uh, due to their settling, the particles tend to, to orient horizontally. And we study that because we see the signal. We are, we are certain, certain that we have particle orientation, right? Maybe it's not spread all over the layer or all over uh, the extent of the dust plume, but it's something that uh, it appears in certain cases. Excellent. Uh, Nitsko, please. Uh, Vasilis, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure if this question uh, really makes sense, but uh, did you ever consider the effect of uh, a strong convection, which happens from time to time uh, if you are close to the Atlantic, uh, uh, where uh, there are really strong uh, electric forces, as, as we know? I mean, that's a very uh, uh, organized. Uh, uh, dynamics and uh, if, if this is unstable, of course, uh, electric uh, charging is, is uh, present. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, does make any sense to, to make some kind of connection with that or not? Yeah, it might, it might slow down, but I really don't know because I'm trying to approach the phenomenon from measurement. So I cannot measure within mm -hmm. uh, deep convection. So we are, what we try to do is to see in Cap Verde, uh, during the transport with a straight dry cell, let's say more or less, uh, mm -hmm. what are the properties there? And the, the, the best I can do is to measure, you know, up to uh, DODs up to one, uh, which are uh, in densities that could justify the development of electric field capable of sustaining the particles there. Because otherwise we should see something like the cell decreases in altitude and then due to the convection we see an uplift and then again which is not the case because we have studied uh, calypso climatologists for the cell uh, center of mass and does not show that it it decreases in altitude and then increases this is not happening mm -hmm. okay so what are the challenges for? I mean, you're talking about this scattering data data set that, that you're you're generating um, in your institute. So, what are the challenges that you're finding uh, in that in that um, in that calculation? Yeah, we 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 are trying to to think of uh, where to find resources because it's very costly in terms of processing to calculate all these properties for uh, these size distributions. And uh, for the models, the detailed uh, particle models that we want to, to import. And uh, for that, uh, we need some high performance computers. We're trying to do our best, but there is a lot of process. We are in 20% of the development, let's say, something like that. And uh, the, the second thing we're trying to do is to see how these radiative properties and updated properties can uh, affect the radiation closure experiment what is happening with the heating rates within the cell, both for aerosols from the updated properties, but also from the water vapor, which is very critical as well. And if this uh, radi radiation it can create some convection that can explain uh, the super cross uh, sustain, sustaining uh, particles. Excellent. More questions for the cities? I can continue. Yeah. So, um, so how are you? I can also ask questions if oh, you want. Sure. Please. Because uh, you do many, many research with gliders and, and satellite and ground based, but the, do you have any experience with sailometers? Yeah, sailometers are very useful tools. However, in the in the for the dust case, Sarah, we have 
a lot of attenuation for the salometer. And then you never know if you have covered the full layer or not, because it may attenuate within the middle of the layer, layer let's say. And then you don't know the real extent of the layer and either the concentration or an optical property backscatter. So you but need power providers for that high power. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's clear that for sources, this is really like a limitation, but maybe for long range, more long range transport regions, you can gather at least the, the, the altitude of the layer, and then this can give you an idea about not, not necessarily, for example, we have this halo system that is uh, more powerful than the seilometer in Cabo Verde. It does not reach the top of the sun. It loses the signal. We have high it's signals. Same low. happens in Tenerife and Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. The seilometer is degraded to the intensity to, to the top, to the, yeah, to the sun. Yeah. But Tropos has installed this uh, system that we developed, we deployed for uh, Cabo Verde for us cross permanently in Cabo Verde. So this system provides real time uh, data online and you can inspect it's a very useful station for dust research. Yeah, because it's a kind of low cost sensor in comparison with the LiDAR, yeah. Yeah. I think that the participants today are a little bit shy, but we have someone that wants to say something. This is cool. Let me check, please. Franco Marenko. Franco. You are now allowed to talk. Hello, Vasilis. Uh, have you ever, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, seminar. Uh, I, was, I wanted to step in on the question on cilometers, actually, because it's true that they don't have the power of, uh, of LIDARs, but on the other hand, they could be very, hand, uh, very easily deployed in large networks and have a a better uh, spatial coverage. And when we're talking about modeling, data simulation and all that, uh, it is also important to have this, let's say, uh, larger uh, coverage of, of, the, of the space. So I would just wanted to ask you if you can comment on this aspect of the cilometers. Yeah. Hi, Franco, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, as I said to Sarah, but I'm afraid that we lose information with say, lometers for the top of the sal, let's say, if we talk about the sal. And in high ODs, I don't know how well this instrument can cover everything. But for sure, it's, they are useful. But I wouldn't rely on it for retrievals, like the ones we have with these lighters I saw here. Uh, we don't have depolarization in say, lometers. There are some developments, but not yet validated. We have only attenuated by scatter. We cannot get this, this uh, measurement from actually from observations is difficult to reproduce backscatter and at the end of backscatter. We have low signal to noise ratios. We have several problems with cellometers. Sorry for being pessimistic, Franco. <laughs> uh, there is a comment in the Q&A from Alexandra. Sekeri, and the salometer in Cape Verde didn't detect the majority of the cell layer in ASCOS containers, confirming your, your, your sentence. Mm -hmm. Basically, thanks, Alexandra. I don't know if you want to add anything else, but uh, yeah, just raise your hand if you want to say something. I, I have a question. I have a question for for like related to coarse dust on the, you know, we have been measuring um, at sources, as you know, and uh, you know, one of the problems that we have there, uh, so there is like to, to we're looking at, at, at another side of the, of, the, of the problem, which is, you know, how many of the, those coarse particles are emitted. And as you know, uh, we have uh, a lot of issues with inlets there, because, you know, if we want to measure the super coarse, we need inlets, inlets are inefficient, and therefore like there's a strong uncertainty. There are other difficulties beyond the inlets that may, may also make our uh, estimates of super coarse dust uh, probably underestimated because there are processes like dry deposition that affect the measurements, things like that, right? So from a experimentalist point of view, um, how, how can we tackle that? 
um, what ideas uh, could be feasible? Like we're using already CDAs, Cloud uh, Droplet Analyzers, which has a, have a, a higher volume of measurement. So we have statistically speaking more chances of sensing the, but still we have the sensing the coarse particles because that's another issue like besides the, uh, besides the inlets, but but we have the inlet issue. And so how do we, how do, how do we deal with that? Are there any remote uh, instrumentation that can be used to tackle that on a mission? Uh, what is your opinion of that? Yeah, Carlos, this is a great question. I believe that we are not ready for super coarse mold measurements actually. What we had in aerosol science for in the in situ community was started with the health applications, you know? So we are talking about 2.5, 10 micron tops, PM10. So in that sense, uh, the in situ measurements suffer from the inlet issue, of course, and other issues with the humidity. We have dry samples and then we cannot compare with the in situ. But I think that I do not have an opinion on that for the in situ. I have for sure Claire Rider can reply on that and for sure they, they use open path uh, sensors and also cloud probes. Yeah, this is what they do now. And this is how they reconstruct the size distribution towards the super coarse mode. And, but the strange thing is that I, I, I think that we are not ready either from the remote sensing part. Of course, the short wave is uh, sensitive to these sizes, but maybe not as much as we would like to see. For example, I calculate angstrom exponents for the cases that we have reports of 60 microns from Franco, and I don't see any variability for the angstrom within the cell. So this means that maybe we do not see the supercross. Uh, particles also in our measurements, the, the visible ones, right? Maybe the infrared is the solution here. I, I really don't know. And this is why I, 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 I try to see the orientation measurements beyond the, the impact or radiation, which we expect to have, uh, also as a tracer for the super coarse presence or the prevailing of the super coarse particles within the volume. Mm -hmm. If they are dominant in concentration, then maybe this is the, the reason why we see it. And updrafts can uplift, you know, the, the fine mode and sustain the coarse mode. And then you have a size segregation within the layer. Because we see something like that uh, in, uh, in our orientation measurement. Maybe this is something that could provide information of the super, super coarse mode. Otherwise, the reference we have at the moment is Claire Rider's measurements with the car probes and Franco's with the drones. There's a question. Perhaps Sarah, you can give the floor to Greg so he can ask a question uh, directly. There's a question in the Q and A. Greg is allowed to talk now. Greg, you can uh, talk. I can do it. Okay, can that's a question from uh, Greg Suster. About, he's going to uh, talk about uh, Greg. Who's there? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yes. okay good. Good. Um, sorry, I don't know how to get this video working, but um, yeah, Vasilis, a very nice talk. I, I think you're probably not getting questions because you had so much information and we're just all kind of overloaded here. It was, but it was excellent. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Most um, probably, yeah. My, my question is about um, the Ponzi uh, figure that you show where the Asian dust had quite a bit higher deep holes than the Saharan dust in the Middle East. And I was wondering, do we know something about the mineralogy of Asian dust that, that causes this? Um, I really don't know, Greg. I really don't know. The, the only thing I see in the measurements is that you have larger LIDAR ratios and lower depolarization ratios from the Western Sahara. High, uh, higher than the, in the Asian dust, higher, of course, from the Middle East, which are the lowest ones of the order of 40 in uh, depolarization, sorry, in 25 in depolarization, and 40 in the LIDAR ratio, 40, 40. And then you have Asian dust with the higher values in LIDAR ratios along with the Western Sahara. I do not have an explanation on that. Even for the Western Sahara, I do not have an explanation. We have to study with the mineralogical retrievals of Emmet, to my opinion, and this is what we should uh, do in the future with this source receptor analysis. When we have measurements of LIDAR ratio to connect it with different mineralogies, to cluster the measurements on different mineralogies, maybe. If this is feasible with EMIT, I think that we will have a reply to your question, to my opinion. 
Right, right. Well, it seems like shape would be the driving factor of this. And, and I don't know that emit will, will help us with that. I mean, what we kind of need is to get some in situ measurements in Asia where we're actually capturing the dust in the air and, and do the same thing in Africa and kind of compare the two, you know, see if there's any difference in shapes. But of course, it's uh, some regions of the world are harder to get to than others. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question about the uh, about the the yeah the shape and the variations. It's not clear there are so many variations though. Yeah, this is actually what Greg is trying to say here that we have lower values of the depolarization, which is related to the shape, and higher values for the lidar ratio in the case of the Saharan dust, which is related also to the refractive index and the imaginary part as well. Here. So maybe. It is uh, the mineralogy maybe affects lighter ratio, but also the polarization. So I really don't know, Greg, how to reply on that. Shape should play a role for sure, also here. So, so, Greg, do you have do you have the um, more? I mean, do you have an estimate of, of what is the the order of magnitude of the variations in shape that would explain? Uh, those variations in the depolarization radio. Is that something that you can quantify? Theoretically, you mean, Carlos? Theoretically, yes. No? <laughs> uh, yeah. Most most lighter folks that I know don't, like Vasilis pointed out, the, we are, in terms of theory for backscatter and depol, uh, we're kind of in the dark ages. We're, we're, a lot of folks aren't too happy with the uh, spheroids and spheres that we need to go beyond that. And we're just starting to make progress in that area, which is great. So, so there's a question, there's a comment here by Alexandra Tsereki that I may address, which is a major may affect uh, shape. Well, I mean, what we're seeing is that not that much, um, you know, you have a lot of aggregates in dust, so uh, aggregated particles. So therefore that tends to homogenize the shape um, and we didn't see, for example, in our campaigns, a lot of change with size or with mineralogy on the shape. But of course, you know, this is limited to certain uh, areas and this is not you know, universal. So there may be some variation somewhere, but hard to see. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Vasilis. Thank you, Greg. We have two minutes left, um, so I would stay here for another hour. Um, uh, but um, so we'll have to, you know, we have we have we have perhaps time for another question, or we can um, perhaps close. So, is there any other question? Okay. So I will let uh, one of my co-chairs close, either Sara, Stelios, Slobodan. Uh, okay, I will do something that is is recurrent question. You will receive that answer, the questions. No worries, Carlos, no worries, Stelios. All the webinars are recorded and available after a few days in the DAS Regional Center website under the uh, publication section. Then slides from Vasilis, but also the recording. It will be available a few days after. Don't, don't ask me if it's, it will be tomorrow because probably it's at the end of the week, but it will be there, okay? And also um, Carlos and Diana, because as may, as may you know, some of you, I won't be anymore as coordinating this activity because I moved to WMO. Then it will be Carlos, Diana, Stelios, and Nitsko and Ernest, who are now the staff of the regional center to take care of these webinars. Uh, we'll announce the next speaker. And please remember, subscribe to the newsletter because the announcement will be done through the newsletter of the regional center. And it will be around mid-February, if everything goes fine. If you have complaints, just contact Carlos and Diana. <laughs> And Stelius and Mitsko, they will be super happy <laughs> to receive your, your uh, uh, mails. And um, with it, you can close. So thank you very much, Vasilis. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, we'll keep up the seminars. 
Um, so if you want to propose a DAS related seminar, uh, uh, do want to share to the community with the community your your research, your thoughts. You're very welcome to to contact us, and uh, we will make sure that in future. So we have a already kind of quite covered for the next few months, but you know we will have slots uh, in a few months from now. So thanks very much, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.